I grew up in a church that taught that all supernatural gifts of the Spirit and all miracles ceased in the first century when the last apostle died. That teaching greatly limited my faith and my growth in the Lord. It wasn't until I was in my 30s that I discovered that the gifts of the Spirit are still in operation, that God is still performing miracles. And the greatest miracles He performs today involve the radical change that occurs in lives when people put their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Stay tuned for a fascinating interview with one such person. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. It is great to have you with us today and to have a special guest in the studio with Nathan Jones and myself, and that is August Rosado. It's great to be back with you. Well, August, it's always great to have you in the studio. We always get a tremendous response when you're here. And I, I opened this program with a uh, a statement that I grew up in a church that did not believe that the gifts of the Spirit operated today, did not believe that God performed miracles today. All that was stuff, just stuff that stopped in the first century. Mm -hmm. And uh, growing up in that uh, sort of uh, situation, I didn't realize I had God in a box. And, and I didn't realize too that you can put God in a box. As, as weak and silly as we are, we can take the Almighty God, put Him in a box and limit His mm -hmm. operation in our lives by our unbelief. Yeah. Jesus could not perform any mighty miracles in His hometown because of their unbelief belief. And so one day as I'm reading through uh, over a period of time, I ran across two scriptures that changed my attitude about that. The first one was in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7 where he wrote to the church and said, you will not lack any gift as you await eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We're not going to lack any gift as we wait, wait for His revelation. That means the gifts of the Spirit are still operative today. And then the other one that I discovered that radically changed my life was Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means the Jesus of the Bible, the miracle working Jesus of the Bible is still alive today. And He is still on the throne. God is on His throne. He still hears prayers. He still answers prayers. He still performs miracles. And I believe the greatest miracles that God performs in the world today is the transformation of lives. And I look upon you as a classic example of that. Tell us what it was like not to know Christ and how you came to know Him. Well, you know, Doc Reagan, when I came to faith in Jesus Christ uh, 28 and a half years ago, April 22nd, 1988, 10.49 a.m. on a Thursday morning. <laughs> Whoa, okay. I remember it like it just happened yesterday. Prior to that salvation experience, I mean, I come from a family of 14. Well, there's only six of us left today because the rest of them are dead due to prostitution, mm. drugs, alcoholism. And if someone did not care enough to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with me on that day, You'd probably be dead I'd be six feet on the ground right now. Yeah. Mm. But prior to that, my whole life consisted of partying every single day. Drinking, selling drugs. That was my life. That's all I knew until it took a death in my family. Uh, one of my older brothers died of a drug deal gone bad. And the night after his funeral, I walked home absolutely inebriated. But I remember looking up into the sky, and this is exactly what I said. God answered the prayer of an unsaved man on his way to hell. I looked up into the sky and I said, God, if you are really there, then prove to me that you're really there. And the next day <laughs> at work, with a hangover, hangover and a half, I'm not proud of that. Some guy got transferred from another animal shelter that he was working at, and I was supposed to train this guy. <laughs> he comes in singing, whistling, <laughs> singing songs about Jesus. I said, what in the world's this guy's problem? <laughs> and uh, it was right at lunch break. Yeah. He looked at me and he said, August, I need to ask you a question. I said, what? He said, if you were to die right now, would you go to heaven or hell? Wow. No one has ever asked me a question mm. like that before. Nobody. Got your attention, huh? <clears throat> Got my attention and then some. And I said, uh, no, I, I don't have any idea. He opened his Bible to John 3, 16. We all know that passage. For God so loved yeah. the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He put my name in that verse. For God so loved August oh that my. he gave his only begotten. Mm. He personalized it. That if August would believe in him, August would not perish or go to hell, but August would have everlasting life. Right there and then. I mean, if the gifts of the Spirit are, are not today, then the Holy Spirit went out of business a long time ago. Amen. Right at that very day, April 22nd, 1988. Who trained who Spirit, then? 
What is it? <laughs> who trained who then? Because you're supposed to train him, and he trained you to he give the gospel. He schooled that, me that he day. He schooled brother. you that day. He schooled he me that day. Yeah. And uh, right at that very day, I got on my knees. Wow. With all those barking animals. I got on my knees and I trusted in Jesus Christ Praise as Lord. my personal Savior. And, and where was all this taking place? Because you have got a rather unusual accent uh, uh, to us here in Texas. Well, if, if some of you don't know, that's New Bedford, Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. So there's where my Yankeeism comes in. Pack the can, Hobby. Pack the can, yeah. Hobby. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but uh, man, and when I punched out that day, well. he said, let me give you a ride home. I said, no, I want to walk home. I said, He's, I said this is awesome. Wow. This is this is great. The Holy Spirit was working. Nathan, that reminds me of 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, yeah. a new creation. Yeah. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become. You came in one August and you left another August. You got that and, right, And brother. did you start looking for a church immediately? Well, the guy that led me to the Lord said, I want to introduce you to my pastor. Okay. I said, that would be awesome. So I go home, and of course, you know, Patty and I were not married then. Yeah. You know, we, we had two kids out of wedlock, yeah. weren't married, really didn't care about getting married. You didn't even know there was anything wrong with that. Didn't, I thought it was, you know, we lived together I mean, long enough, yeah. common law marriage, you know how that, whatever. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I go home, I said, Pat, I said, something amazing <laughs> happened at work today. And uh, she said, let me guess, you got a raise. <laughs> oh, I said, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> she said, well, what happened? I said, some guy came over from uh, another shelter and he was supposed to train me and he shared the greatest news with me that I've ever heard. I trusted in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Oh my. She said, you did what? <laughs> and I said, I trusted in Christ as my personal Savior. She said, oh, no, no, no. You're not going to be bringing this religion into the house. Oh, we're Catholics. I said, but we're not practicing Catholics. <laughs> she says, I don't care. You're not bringing this religion into the house. And I was so confused. So the guy oh. called me that led me to the Lord, Chris. And, and by the way, he was our best man at our wedding. And so, <laughs> and so uh, he called me up. I told him, I said, Chris, I don't know what's going on. She is mad. She won't even talk with me. She said, he said, well, can I bring the pastor over? Oh. I said, I don't think that's a good idea. He said, well, let me just bring the pastor over after dinner. So then after dinner, pastor comes over, tall black Baptist preacher. He comes in, and he's looking around. I had Budweiser paraphernalia all over my house because <laughs> I, I collected Budweiser stuff. Oh, you know? okay. I had phones, everything. <laughs> and so uh, he's looking around. He says, you sure this guy got saved? <laughs> and so, and so, and so um, he's congratulating me. And uh, Patty's sitting right there, man. And you can see the steam rising off her ears. And so uh, he said, August, let's go in the room. Let the pastor deal with her. I said, okay. We go in the room. He says, August, I need you to pray. I said, well, what is that, like Hail Mary? Said, no, no, no. <laughs> Just talk to God. Just pray. That's biblical prayer. Talk to God. So for the first time in my worthless life, I'm talking to God. I'm saying, Lord, I don't understand this whole entire thing, but please help Patty to understand what happened to me. So 30 minutes goes by. It's just silent out there. I thought she probably already threw him out. Mm -hmm. I peek around the corner. Patty has her head bowed. She's trusting oh, in Jesus Christ wow. as a Hallelujah, personal savior. Hallelujah, man. Hallelujah. Man, again, the spirit did not go out of business. I don't care what anybody said. Well I, well, I want you to tell the story of how you became convicted that you needed to get married. Yes. Well, here's the deal. Because you okay. didn't know anything about the Bible. It, I, know, I knew nothing about the scripture. So a week after, that same pastor, that Baptist preacher, said, August, we want to go to a church in Johnston, Rhode Island, the church that we're members of today, Greater Rhode Island Baptist Temple in Johnston. And he says, there's going to be a revival there. So I want you to come and check it out. So this was the, actually the first time I've been to a Bible believing yeah. church. So we're sitting down, the guy's up there, he's preaching. And then all of a sudden, he uses a word that I wasn't familiar with. You know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, okay? Fornication. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm, Nobody knows and now what the that pastor's sitting is. over here. Yeah. Patty's where you are. And, I, and I'm over here, and he's like, I said, fornication. So uh, I looked at my pastor. I said, Pastor Menes, what, what does he mean by fornication? Now, he knew we weren't married. He said, well, August, that's two people living together without a marriage license. <laughs> he's going like this. I'm like, really? I, said, I thought it was something like some new skin disease. <laughs> fornication. <laughs> So I'm like, Patty, no fornication is that's two people living together without a marriage license. <laughs> oh, we down. need to get married. So uh, that was my proposal to her, by the way. Oh, okay. and so, <laughs> romantic. <laughs> it was real romantic. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so uh, two weeks later, we got married. Oh, my. We did the right thing. Amen. Amen. And uh, it's been 28 and a half years. Well, how in the world did a person with that unusual background get involved in ministry? Brother, I just wanted to be a behind the scenes guy. Now, one of my pet peeves is public speaking. Pet peeves? I, yeah, I, I get butterflies. Even today, 28 and a half years later, God called me to preach in 1992. Well, you sure covered up well. Yeah, and I, yeah he does. <laughs> and uh, I said, Lord, I said, I'm not going to preach. So you he called to, you almost immediately? Immediately. Yeah. I, I said, I can't do this. You're going to have to find someone better than me. I, I cannot stand in front of people and speak. 
God said, I want you to preach. I said, I'm not going to preach. He said, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> I said, oh, no, I'm not. He said, oh, yes, you are. I said, oh, no, I'm not. Well, I gave in, went to Bible college, went to Good. Friends of Israel in 1992 for that one year of schooling. Wow. Come back and home. That was tough for you, wasn't it? It was, it was very difficult. It was yeah. very difficult. But the Lord, he got us through it. So then we enrolled with the Institute of Jewish Christian Studies, yes. Zola Levitt Ministries. We graduated from that. God said, I want you to pastor. I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to pastor. I said, I'm not going to do it, Lord. He says, oh, yes, you are. I said, oh, no, I'm not. He says, oh, yes, you are. I said, oh, no, I'm not. How are you well, making your living then? Well, I had a window cleaning business. A window cleaning. And okay. uh, that was supporting us. But when God calls you, he's going to win all the time. <laughs> yes. I pastored my first church in 1999 there in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Wow. It was only till 2003. God said, you need to go out there and teach people Bible prophecy. So Patty and I, we took a step of faith. 2008, we officially went out on the road. God has kept us busy. Well, your story reminds me of this statement in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. Mm. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that He may strongly support those whose heart is completely His. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're educated, not educated, mm -hmm. if you're smooth or not smooth. If your heart has been given to the Lord, He's going to use you. Mm -hmm. And you know mm -hmm. something? I don't know why, but He's been using me. <laughs> well, why did you decide to focus on Bible prophecy of all things? Well, that's when that Baptist preacher comes into play again. Okay. okay. He said, August, he said, we're going to go to a Jewish synagogue in New Bedford. And that's going to be on the Sabbath. And uh, we're going to go there and we're going to talk with them and hopefully have a dialogue and share in the gospel of, he said the word Yeshua. I said, Yeshua? I said, what in the world does that mean? Is that like some type of new talent all or something? <laughs> you know? And, and he, he, he says, no, he says, that's Jesus' first century Jewish name. Yeah. We're going to go to the Jewish people, the apple of God's eye, his chosen people. I said, his chosen people? I thought the Christians were the chosen people. No, I didn't even know nothing about replacement theology, and I'm teaching replacement theology. <laughs> and so yeah. I said, well, okay, Pastor, yeah. I'll go with you. And when we yeah. got there, I mean, the Holy Spirit just opened the doors for him to share all of these messianic prophecies. And it was wow. right there and then. The Holy Spirit hit me right between the eyes. And he says, I want you to teach about the Jewish people wow. in Bible prophecy and the rapture of the church. And so I dedicated 28 and a half years to do exactly that. Oh, I'm you, still even, learning something new every single day. Did you even know any Jewish people when you were living in New Bedford? None. Then? So you picked None. a ministry and a group of people that you had no connection to. Had no connection to whatsoever. It was God yeah. that brought this whole thing together, Nathan. That reminds me of God calling Paul, a Jew, to spend his ministry teaching to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Yeah. A Jewish missionary to the Goyim, yeah. uh, uh, to the Gentiles. Yeah, and then the opposite with you. And it's the opposite with me. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. And, do you get to speak to a lot of uh, Jews who aren't saved? Well, you know teach something? Them the Lord? We go to Israel three or four times a year. Okay. And for the three times and that we go And sometimes you, you just go to uh, witness, don't you? To witness to the Jewish people. Yeah. We pass mm -hmm. our complete Hebrew Bibles, whether we're in the Galilee, where we're, whether we're in Jerusalem or Elah in the extreme south. We go into malls, coffee shops, wherever the Holy Spirit opens the doors, and we share these Messianic prophecies with the Jewish people, well, and I, Arabs for that matter. Well, I know that you spend a lot of your time teaching and preaching and writing about Israel. Why is there so much focus in your ministry on Israel and on the Jewish people? Well, you know, I just did a, a TV interview uh, recently for another uh, ministry, and I was asked that same exact mm -hmm. question. People say, why do you support Israel so much? Well, I support Israel because God tells me to do so. Mm -hmm. The principle of Genesis 12, 3, I'll bless those who bless thee, curse those who curse thee. So when you bless Israel, God says, I'll bless you. Mm -hmm. When you curse the Jews, well, you're asking for serious trouble. So I dedicated 20 and a half years to do exactly that. When I read the scriptures, I find that word Israel mentioned 2,566 times. You say, well, where did you come up with that number? I took a Strong's Concordance, <laughs> and I circled how many times Israel was found. I did, I did a first count, and I did a recount, and I came up with the same exact number, 2,566 times God calls the land Israel. The very center of the earth, based on Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5. Well, also, the Messiah, since, we'll you're, since you mm -hmm. are focused, God called your focus to be on Bible prophecy, isn't it true that end time Bible prophecy focuses on Israel? End time Bible prophecy Give us some examples on of what Israel. I'm talking about there. Uh, well, again, uh, for example, uh, when we talk about Romans 11, 25, and 26, when the Messiah returns at a second coming, he ain't coming back to New Bedford, Massachusetts. <laughs> He's not. He ain't coming back no. to Washington, D.C. He's coming back to Eretz Israel. He's coming back to the you land. You mean Texas is not his holy land? Texas is not, is not his holy land. It may be God's country, but it's not his holy land, okay? Uh, but when he comes back, he's coming back based on Ezekiel 5.5, 5, Deuteronomy 32.8. He's coming back to the very center of the earth. He's coming back 
to the land of Israel. Yes. He's going to make the city of Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem, the city of gold, the capital of planet Earth during that future millennial kingdom reign well, of Christ. Well, I find a lot of Christians are surprised to discover that uh, there are prophecies concerning Israel that are being fulfilled before their very eyes today. What would some of those be? Oh, I, I, we can just talk about this. You know, there are those that are saying, well, there are no prophecies being fulfilled today. That's <laughs> yeah. hogwash. Yeah. Yeah. You can say that here in Texas, right? That's hogwash. <laughs> That's right. Okay? There are many prophecies that are unfolding. What about right their now. regathering? There you example. go. I can go to Isaiah chapter 66, verses 7 and 8. Shall a nation be born in one day? I'm not a date setter, but I will give you a date. May the 14th of 1948. That's that right. prophecy That's right. was fulfilled in one day. I'll give mm -hmm. you Isaiah chapter 11, verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> God said, I'll bring them back into the land the second time. That implies there was a first diaspora and yeah. a first aliyah. That implies there was a second diaspora, 70 AD. And that second Aliyah has been happening since 1897 up until the modern creation of the right. Jewish state of Israel. So yes, prophecy is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. Things now like the, the uh, reestablishment of their, of, of their language, for example, because they stopped talking, speaking Hebrew when they were dispersed around the world. Absolutely. The Bible says it will be revived. In Absolutely. The, the revival of their land. The revival of the land, Isaiah 35, verse 1, that when the Jews would come back, the land itself would It said respond. it would be like the Garden of Eden. Like and you go to Israel beautiful. today, and what do you see? I mean, just every it's kind of agricultural beautiful. produce you can imagine. And, and you got the, the Temple Institute trying to rebuild the third temple, which yeah. we read about in the tribulation. And I was just right in their brand new facilities there yeah. in Jerusalem. They got everything ready, ready to go. Ready to go. Ready, ready to go. go for a third Jewish temple. Well, people say, well, how do you know there's going to be a third Jewish temple? Well, just read the Word of God. Yeah. Daniel They've got it ready to go. You know, I, I think what's going to happen is that when they can, do that, they're going to put up a, a tabernacle like the tabernacle of Moses, a tent temple, then start building the permanent one around it. But they can put it up overnight like that. They're when ready. I, when I was at the Temple Institute, Dr. Reagan, I said, listen, if you were to start construction on the temple tomorrow, oh. how long would it be? You know what she told me? We can have a temple up and running in one year. One year. One year. Yeah. One year. Here I am thinking maybe four or five, ten years. One year. They got the technology. Well, what, what, what do you say to, to people in mainline churches? who take the position that the Jews are Christ killers and because they're Christ killers God has washed His hands of them, has no purpose left for them whatsoever and uh, that their persecution and suffering is justified. Well, you know, that really sticks in my craw when I hear people talk like that. You know, the, the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. They're Christ killers. God wants nothing to do with them because they've sinned. Well, let me let the church in on a little secret. Christians sin too. Does that mean God is finished with <laughs> no, you? No, we don't. You know? Are Acts, you sure about that? <laughs> Acts chapter 4 verse 27 tells us exactly who the guilty parties, plural, are. Yes. The Jews right. and the Gentiles. The Jews gave the order. The Gentiles carried it out. We're all responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. So yeah, it's not you and fair. I are. We, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. It's yeah. not fair to just say it's the Jews, it's anti Semitism, and uh, by Jesus the way, God died, is not done with Israel. Jesus died for all our sins. I mean, yeah. I, I'm as responsible for him being on the cross as you are, exactly. or the Jews are, or anybody else. Exactly. And furthermore, the Bible is very clear that God still loves the Jewish people, still has a purpose for them. Uh, the, the three most hated chapters in the New Testament are Romans 9 through 11. Ooh, the the church awful. just will not even talk about them because uh, it, it just, for example, Romans 11 starts out. God has not rejected His people, has He? That's Paul asking. Mm -hmm. And the church says, yes. And what does Paul say? May it never be. God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. And yet for 2,000 years the church has taught the exact opposite of that. The church has said we've, God has washed His hands of Israel. If you, if you hold to replacement theology, then my advice to you is go to the book of Romans, rip out chapters 9, 10, and 11 out of your Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As long as that's there, replacement theology is false doctrine. I, well, what are the responses you get when you tell Jewish people? Because you've had a miraculous transformation and you want to see Jewish people have a miraculous yeah. transformation. But I assume that many Jewish people still have the blinders on, but yes. you see a lot of people still come to the Lord that are Jewish, right? You no, know, we led two Jewish men to the Lord. One of them was in Haifa okay. at a restaurant. I shared my testimony with this young <laughs> Jewish man. And uh, I told him how Yeshua changed and transformed my life and that He can do the same for you. We shared with him those Messianic prophecies right there in the restaurant, Doc Reagan. Tears yeah. started oh, wow. coming down from his eyes. Oh. He kneeled right there on the table in a busy restaurant wow. and we led him to the Messiah. Well, that's Praise a point that, that I often make to people when they tell me, well, I, you know, I'd like to witness for Jesus, but I don't know all the verses and everything. And I said, hey, 
the greatest witness is to tell people how Jesus changed your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can do that. You mm-hmm. can do that. You can tell people how he changed your life, and that will have a tremendous impact on them. It sure will. I think we all should have a testimony. Yes. You know, yes. The Bible says be, be ready in season and out of season to give your testimony. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says we need to be ready yes. to give an answer. And another point you just made is very important that I emphasize to people. If you're going to witness to a Jewish person, don't open the New Testament mm-hmm. because they mm-hmm. have been taught that that is a Gentile book. They've been taught that it is a horrible book. It shouldn't be in the Bible. You don't need to. If you know the Old Testament prophecies, all you need to do is show them how Jesus fulfilled what their own prophets said. On the day of Pentecost when Peter preached the very first gospel sermon, the only thing he did was he said, the prophet said this, Jesus fulfilled. The prophet yes. said this, Jesus fulfilled. The prophet said this, Jesus fulfilled. Finally, they just yelled out, what must we do? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Amen. I mean, familiarize yourselves with the Messianic and prophecies. And Paul told Timothy, he said, you know, from the youngest years, uh, you learned yes. uh, what, what's necessary for salvation. Well, he didn't have the New Testament. It didn't exist. It didn't exist. He learned it all from the Old Testament. And that's what you have to use if you're going to work with Jewish people. Well, Yeshua, what did he do? In the Gospels <laughs> quoted the Old Testament. Testament. Right. Mm-hmm. The gospel is replete throughout the Old Testament. Right. And that's exactly what we use when we go to Israel and share the gospel with the Jewish people. We go right the to Old the Testament. Old Testament, right in their own backyard. Sure. That's what had that guy on his knees, a waiter at a restaurant in Haifa oh, with my. tears coming down his eyes. That was a Ruach HaKodesh. That was the Holy Spirit of God that hit him right between the eyes. Amen. Simply because we went to the Old Testament, not the new, the old, and yeah. share those prophecies yeah. with him. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of a, a fellow who has a national television program, Sid Roth, who's a Messianic Jew. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I remember him talking about how he grew up in New York City and he used to go to the New York Public Library for lunch. And he would sit there and read the magazines and newspapers while he ate his lunch. And one day he looked down and there was a, a Ripley's Believe It or Not. And he opened it up and started turning through it. And there was a picture of a Jesus type person that said at the bottom, Believe it or not, Jesus was a Jew. And he thought, man, a life. These Gentiles tell such lies. And he looked around to make sure nobody's looking. He tears the page out. He takes it home to his Orthodox Jewish father. And he says, look at the lies they're telling. He says, well, son, he was a Jew. And he was, he was astonished. So the next time he went to the library, he went back in the deepest, darkest part of the library, got a New Testament and started reading it and accepted wow. Jesus as his oh, wow. Lord and Savior. You see, again, I, the Holy Spirit did not go out of business in the first century. <laughs> no. no. He is still working those very still miracles Still changing today. hearts. And still still changing. If he can do it with this guy, he can do it with a Jew or a Gentile for that Well, matter. I've been working with a Jewish friend online, and, and she's very Jewish, but secular Jewish. And she hates Christmas, and she says she feels so left out about anything and, and all. I said, hey, it's a Jewish family in Israel, and the only Gentiles involved were Persian Magi who were bowing down to a Jewish king. She'd never heard that oh, before. Wow, that's never a good taught. point. Well, well let me ask you a general, more general question yeah. of, about Bible prophecy in general, and that is that it's probably one of the most ignored subject in churches today. Pastors just stay away from it. And, and I, I, I want you to, what is the importance of pastors at least preaching from time to time about Bible prophecy and about the return of Jesus? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Dr. Reagan, last time that we were together and we talked about this very subject, and I called the church in uh, Warwick, Rhode Island, and the pastor was extremely nice, but he said, August, he says, I really appreciate what you're doing. He says, but we can't have that type of subject taught in this church. I said, Pastor, why not? It's a, it's a subject that permeates one third of the Word of God. Mm-hmm. One out of every three verses in the scriptures deal with Bible prophecy. Why, why won't you have someone teach it? He says, well, our people just can't understand it. I don't even understand it, and I have a doctorate. Oh, well, I said, well, you sir, can I fix think that you, problem. You need to get your money back from that school. <laughs> You know, I remember taking Old Testament classes. We took prophetic class. You can't get out of seminary without taking classes on prophecy. So then they graduate, and then they won't teach it because they say they don't understand it. So you got to wonder what kind of education they were getting. Well, you know, it's like pie in the sky theology. You know, we're just going to, you know, like pan millennialism. It's all going to pan out in the end. So we shouldn't be bothering ourselves. Second Timothy three sixteen says. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, Mm -hmm. for training in righteousness. We have no justification for taking one-fourth to one-third of God's Word, putting it on the shelf and saying, that's not for us today. It is for us today. And I often tell preachers, if you will ever really preach that, get your people to believe two things. Number one, Jesus really is coming back. The average Christian believes it here, but they don't believe it there. And number two, that is an event that could occur any moment. You will transform their lives, and they will commit themselves to evangelism and holiness. And what more could you ask for? Oh, amen. I mean, that's right out of Titus chapter two. You know, 
We're looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The church today is not looking yeah. for him. I think we're more concerned on who the Antichrist is going to be. Well, if you were to sum up your message, what would you sum it up as? What, what is your basic message? My basic message today is that, number one, Jesus Christ is indeed coming soon. Yes. Number two, we need to be busy for the Lord. Yes. Mm -hmm. Living holy, righteously, and godly in this present world. I don't want the Lord to come and catch me unawares yeah. as I'm living a sinful lifestyle out Amen. of the will of God. Amen. Amen. We need to be living holy, righteously, and godly in this present age. Winning souls, whether Jew or Gentile, to Jesus Christ. Because I believe, Dr. Reagan, we're living on borrowed time. Yeah. Yeah. We're running on fumes, as they say. Right. So we need to get busy for the kingdom right here and right now because time is running out. And, that, and you say we're living on board time because the Lord gave us signs to watch for. And we can see those signs all around Absolutely. us today. I mean, it's just, this is one of the most exciting times to live in all of history, except for the first time that the Lord came. I'll tell you, it makes me want to practice my rapture takeoff, brother, <laughs> here right now. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we're seeing prophecy unfold right before our very eyes. It, it, I believe we could be that generation, Dr. Reagan. Now, you're located in Connecticut, but you go all over the nation preaching and teaching, don't you? Actually, we're located in Lincoln, Rhode Island, right near the oh, Connecticut border. Rhode Island, right near the I'm Connecticut sorry. border. Yeah, Rhode but the Lord has opened the doors for my wife and I to travel. Well, how about looking there. right into that camera there and telling people how to get in touch with you? Well, folks, you can contact us at Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries. Our website is Today in Bible Prophecy. Dot org. You can sign up for our newsletters while you're there. You can take Israel trips uh, with us. You can contact us, look at our, our videos, our audio, pictures from Israel. And, and you have a radio streaming program. Yeah, uh, we're on Facebook every single morning at 11 a.m. Eastern okay. Standard Time teaching a book on prophecy. So you can check that out as well. Well, brother, I appreciate it. Thanks for being with us Thank today. You, God bless you. Thank May you. the Lord continue to pour appreciate out His Spirit on you. Folks, that's our program for today. I hope it's been a blessing to you. And if not, you better check your pulse. Until next week, I hope you'll be with us then. This is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministry saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Dr. David Reagan's book, God's Plan for the Ages, contains a comprehensive overview of all aspects of Bible prophecy. It's written in an easy to understand, down to earth style that you will find appealing. In addition to all the prophecies concerning the first and second comings of the Messiah, it deals with a host of other prophetic questions, such as, What happens when you die? What will heaven be like? What's the future of the earth? Where is the United States in prophecy? When is the rapture most likely to occur? Is the Antichrist alive today? Are there signs of the times that are unique to our day and age? The book contains a variety of charts and diagrams which illustrate various aspects of Bible prophecy. The book is available for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. Please call the number you see on the screen Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, and ask for it by name or order online at lamblion.com. The book contains 42 exciting chapters about Bible prophecy and runs a total of 415 pages. Again, it can be yours for a gift of $20 or more, including shipping. And for a limited time, we will include a copy of Dr. Reagan's booklet, Are You Ready for the Lord's Return? Ask for offer number 751 when calling the number you see on the screen or order on our website at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.